Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. They set the standards for investigative reporting. They are the consciences of their generation, detectives for the people, with encyclopedic knowledge of New York City politics. Their leaving the village voice is a quote-unquote colossal loss to New Yorkers and a relief to malefactors of all stripes. They are, of course, Wayne Barrett and Tom Robbins, muckrakers extraordinaire, partners in grime, equal opportunity squalls, journalism award winners, feared and respected even by their targets. Wayne and Tom, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Wayne, I'm reading a post that's on January 4, 2011, and it says, it's time for something new. What happened? Why? Well, I said the next line was, uh, if I didn't recognize it, others did. And, you know, and I didn't recognize it. And I do think I'm going to do some, some new things and hope I'm not going to walk too far away from that tradition that you just so wonderfully described. But I, I was called into the office very abruptly. At The Voice? By at whom? The Voice, by, by the editor, Tony Ortega. Okay. And, you know, he made a, a nice offer, which was consistent with our union contract, which Tom is the union leader, so Tom was present at the meeting. Uh, a nice severance offer. I, I'd been there for uh, 33 years on a regular basis, but I, my first piece was in 1973 Oops. there, before I got the regular column in 1978. And, uh, you know, I certainly was completely unprepared for it. In fact, the last cover story that I did, uh, Tony edits my copy, Tony Ortega. We had the smoothest run we'd ever had. He loved the piece. Uh, I had no indication that there was any uh, dissatisfaction with my work. I still don't, really. He praised my work as he well, informed was me. Was it that, your work? or, yeah. you, or the, He said it was a budget decision. You know, I'm an expensive property. He's an expensive property. And uh, so that's all the explanation that I'll probably ever get as to why I was uh, designated to fill, to plug this uh, budget gap. But I assume they have a real budget gap. All newspapers are in trouble. And, uh, you know, that my time had come. So I didn't recognize it. I thought, you know, I was still, these fingers were still dancing over those keys. Yes, 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 uh, and, and, yes. And, and many of us agree as yes. the reaction show. So then I get to the last line on this, and it says, I never met a corrupt journalist. I even met one, Tom Robbins, so brave that when he heard I was leaving, he quit himself and didn't even tell me he was. I'm going out with the guy who brought me to the dance, Robbins told me, after he resigned, crafting a lead with every fiber of his life. Talk about it. Why? Well, it's true. Wayne did bring me to the dance. I, I was... Uh uh, I worked at The Voice on two different, I'm on my second tour mm -hmm. now, just finishing up. I was there the With the Daily News in between. That's right. And and Wayne and I uh, did a, I was a freelancer, did a piece together back in the 80s, uh, terrific story that, that we both had a great time reporting. And, and afterwards, I just sort of hung around and stayed at The Voice at that point for a couple of years later, leaving with Jack Newfield uh, to go to the uh, Daily News mm -hmm. together. And mm -hmm. I was there for a dozen years. And, you know, one of the issues at the Daily News was always uh, that uh, stories were either too long or there were targets that we were going after that uh, upset somebody. The one great thing about the Village Voice, and I think this remains consistent, is they let you speak with your own voice and they go after everybody, that it is open season. And, and even if it doesn't have the circulation of other papers, I think that's the Voice's great tradition, a, a tradition which continues even without Robbins and Barrett. That I think We don't know about that yet. We don't know about that yet. <laughs> State of the voice, but really the state of journalism, the state of newspapers. Tom, you, you wrote a piece in 2009 called The Mayor's Press Pass, The Unexamined World of uh, Mike Bloomberg, and you talk about the changing news environment. Talk about what that is and what are the political implications of all of that. It's, I think it's economic driven. I mean, the, the demise of print has caused many editors and newspapers, even in New York, which remains a newspaper-rich town. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got three dailies here, which is like, in some cases, three more than other cities have. Right. But 
they don't follow each other's stories. I mean, oh, Wayne will tell you about in, in the in the eighties when a scandal hit the Koch administration. Every paper followed every story every day, mm -hmm. and you created. And you had Newsday out there as, we a, had as four. a fourth well, exactly, paper. Exactly, as a very important fourth. But it, it created a critical mass that mm -hmm. moved the the rock up the hill, forced politicians to be accountable in a way that we don't have now. So we get great stories that are reported in individual papers, but it's someone else's story and it doesn't get picked up. And that's what I meant by Bloomberg's press pass. He didn't have to live in that world. And then, and, and as you say, I mean, we've got some muckrakers and, and good investigative journalists other than yourself, uh, Jim Dwyer, Juan Gonzalez, but there isn't this, this sort of concentrated connections and, and, and cumulativeness to stories. What, I, what's going on? Well, you know, you also have to, you have to observe the fact that we have a media mogul as a mayor and, you know, his best buddies who, who got all together to decide that he should have a third term, you know, are the other media moguls of New York. You know, Mort Zuckerman at the Daily News is one of the mayor's best friends. He'll tell you that. So, you know, you just have to look at the relationships at the top. We've never experienced that before. So the passivity of the media until the third term, we're seeing, I think, an awakened media Ooh. in the third term. But the passivity of the media is in part a byproduct of the relationships at the very top. I don't think it reflects on the quality of the foot soldiers. Right. I think it, you know, it's the generals here or the commander in chiefs here, you know, that that collude. And uh, you know, it's been a it's been a collusion that has has really damaged the the political fabric of the city. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I I'm encouraged by some of the things that have been happening in the in the recent weeks. I, I tell you, if if the plows had been this late before the reelection of of 2009, would we have seen this kind of coverage? Don't you even still see some distance, especially at the Daily News, between the editorial page mm -hmm. and the news reporting? Hey, the Times uh, yeah. too. Yeah. So it's 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 been a, a very unusual. We've had. We, we, we do not have, even in the best of times, I mean, uh, uh, Ed Koch, three-term mayor, was a pallbearer at Abe Rosenthal's funeral. So that says a whole lot. I mean, I, you know, I don't think any mayor of the city of New York is going to be a pallbearer at mine, you know? And, and, and so it says a whole lot. But Ed Koch said really nice things about you. He did, you know, he in did indeed. Time. He did indeed. I mean, he said the I'm reporting talking, was superb. I'm, I don't blame Ed Koch for being a, oh, okay. a pallbearer. Right. I'm saying, right. what's wrong with Abe Rosenthal that this is one of his best friends when he's in charge of the newspaper that covers him? And, and, and Mike Bloomberg is really unique. Both of you guys very recently, in fact, within the last week, have written stories. Uh, you, Tom, uh, hits third... Uh, third term poll wall and you on Sunday, you know, talking about Bloomberg and a cold shoulder. Talk about Mike Bloomberg. Talk about the reaction to this snow incident. It seems like he ain't getting a free pass anymore. And it's the editorial pages as well as the foot soldiers that are hammering this guy. Yeah. What is it? I, I think I think he did hit a third term wall. I mean I think that the fact that he would not account for his whereabouts and still to this day will not tell us where he was is, is simply a break with the bond with the constituents of the city. And I think that actually the Daily News editorial page has hammered him on that. Absolutely. Change, which, Absolutely. Which is unusual the for them to go, that, to go that hard on him. Yep. But I think that he's taken a bridge too far at this point or a bridge unplowed, whichever it is. I think, that, I think that, that this mayor misjudged his popularity, his ratings, and believed that he could continue to sort of have this uh, hands-off attitude, have great people working for him, and everything would be taken care of. I mean, if the stories that we're hearing about his screaming at Joe Bruno, the uh, head of operations and emergency management, mm -hmm. that this guy Steve Goldsmith, the deputy mayor, that's all presumably true, he delegated all of that responsibility to him, and even though he defended this decision to not call it a snow emergency, apparently he was never even consulted. We know now, yesterday, from the, from the testimony at the council hearing. That's a stunning failure of management at the very top. Can, can Humpty Dumpty put, be put back together again, or has this mythology of Mike Bloomberg been deconstructed, this sublime manager? 
Well, he's Just got a technocratic he, wizard. We know that he's more interested in the U.S. Department of the Treasury than he is the New York Department of Sanitation. We know he's mesmerized by whatever is going on in Geithner's shop and couldn't care less about what's going on in Doherty's shop at the Department of Sanitation. So I, I think we have seen, I believe he ran for re-election because he wanted to keep the dream alive of a national run, either for president or vice president. My inkling is he's more, he thinks realistically and that they, there might have been a chance for him to be a Veep candidate in the coming race, and that's really what he was thinking about. But I, he has been so mesmerized since re-elected by national politics that he's lost some of that. I still believe that his first term as mayor was the best term of any chief executive, state or local, that I covered. I think he was an excellent first term. Yeah, mayor. explain, explain yeah. that. I, I mean, yeah. I agree, but... Yeah, I, I, I think he still owes us a second term. And, and somehow he managed to run for a third term, I think, driven really by the boredom of the alternatives. You know, I'm going to be... But he's not been really engaged in this job since he was reelected in 2005. That, that engagement that he had, you know, and I would sit just as an example, and there are lots of examples. When I, I sat with Joel Klein, who I have a lot of respect for at the Department of Education, and he would give me the minute detail when they restructured the, the Department of Education and the school system, he would give me the minute detail of, of Mike Bloomberg's involvement. There wasn't a piece of that puzzle that he did not personally vet and really look at and study. He was involved at the, at, at the foundation of the education reforms, many of which I think have contributed to a better school system. But then when I did a story in the, in the second term about the big innovation of the second term was Plan NYC 2030, and Plan NYC 2030 is where we know what climate change is, we're going to adapt to it. Well, the single most important department was the Department of Environmental Protection in that plan. And I spoke to the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. She'd never had a conversation with him. She'd never had so much as one email exchanged with him about this plan, about the details of this plan. So he cool, kind of pulled back, turned that over to Dan Doctoroff, who's now running his company, you know, and, and there was a level of disengagement about the detail of the big innovation of the second term that was very present in the first term. And, and I just think he doesn't, he likes the ceremony, he likes the attention, uh, but I don't think he's as engaged. You have to really be a detailed guy to be a great mayor. You have to be a detailed guy, too. Well, what about Rudy Giuliani? Rudy Giuliani was a, a, a detailed guy. I, I mean, does that, does, does that make him great? I mean, at, at one point, the mayor said he wanted to be the greatest mayor of New York City. What makes, what makes a great mayor? You know, when Wayne talks about the first term, and, and what made that a great person? The mm -hmm. thing that I think of is that he came in in an incredible budget crunch, almost as bad as the one we're looking at right now. And he did something which today, which would probably be politically impossible for him to even think about, which was that he imposed a new tax. Mm -hmm. And his poll suffered for it. People didn't like it. But he did it because of the fact that I think at that point he believed that he had a bond with people who needed city services. And he basically looked at his budget and he said, I'm not going to leave the poorest out of this budget. I'm not going to leave working people out of this budget. I'm going to try to make it work. And he did. He took a hit in the polls and he built his way back. The economy improved uh, after post 9-11. Tourism started to improve. Mm -hmm. We started to come back. But to me, when Wayne says that was a great first term, I don't disagree with him. I mean, there were, there were things in that term that I, that I didn't like that the mayor did. But to me, that was the profile and courage. That was the moment when he said, OK, you know, I'm going to take a political hit. You know, he came into office saying, I'm not a politician. You know, I'm a businessman. That's, sort of, that's been his selling point. And, and I think every time we get to one of these points where we realize that, like, he is making a political decision, you know, his, his value goes down and his esteem goes down with, with voters and with the public. And we keep seeing them one after another. Doug, could I add one Go thing? Go ahead. He didn't do one tax. He did two taxes in the aftermath of 9-11. He didn't just do the largest property tax increase in the history of the city. He imposed a surcharge on the wealthiest, yep. which he got a Republican Senate yep. to approve. Yep. Now he says, this is the new Mike Bloomberg, you can't tax, tax, rich, uh, tax rich people. He opposes it in every form. So that's a complete reversal. for us. Yeah. We need rich he people. He said at the time, he said at the time, 
oh, and this is in 2003, he said, rich people won't leave because they have to pay some temporary surcharge that increases their taxes in a minuscule way. They're not going to leave town. Now he says, they'll all vanish. They'll all vanish. It's, it's ludicrous. What is, what is it about third terms? Is there something inherent in third terms, or is it just... Well, the part, of the, part of the problem, as we're finding out, is that there's a declining gene pool. You know, is that, you know okay. when you start out with a cadre of really okay. smart, dedicated, tough folks who are looking to do the deed, and then they, they start falling away, and you end up with folks who, you know, I mean, clearly he's tried to recruit people who he thinks have done it very well. Mm -hmm. But as near as I can tell, you know, Howard Wolfson is there because he's trying to ready whatever that future is. That, mm -hmm. That's his main assignment. Right. Uh, Goldsmith is supposed to be there to be able to do the new politics of it, but if the guy doesn't know when to call a snow emergency, I, I don't know what good he is. So... You know, part of what happens, and, and I think apparently this has happened to, uh, you know, every mayor in a third term, Wagner, LaGuardia, Koch, you know, we, we've seen this happen over and over again. You start losing those good people, and you start losing that kind of force of power that you had on the way. Yeah, and also the intensity moving from an Ed Schuyler, wherever you think about Ed, Ed was a maniac. He was constantly worried about operations, and he's all over the place. He's... Uh, tackling, you know, muggers in the street, Goldsmith's in Virginia during a snowstorm. So, I mean, and I think that Goldsmith was a good pick because I think, you know, being an academic and a, a political scientist, I mean, some of that rethinking is important. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on a little bit. What are you working on now? Well, the last piece, I didn't know it was my last piece, but uh, I was doing a cover when I got that call from Tony, in fact, I had just gotten off the phone with a long interview with Al Sharpton. I'm Ooh. doing a, a feature, uh, an investigative story on Al Sharpton. Oh, what is this coming out? Yes, We're waiting. Yeah, yeah, well, We're waiting. Now I have to find a place to, you know, for, to print it, but I'm sure I will. And I, you know, I still have a few loose ends to tie together, but it's a, I looked at the business side of him in a way that I never have before. And, uh, he stopped talking to me in 2004. I, I have known him since he was 16 or something. And so he stopped talking to me in 2004 when I wrote a series about his phony presidential campaign, which was run by Roger Stone, the dirty tricks master of the Republican Party. And for some reason, he didn't like that copy. So he stopped talking to me. So it's pretty good indication that I've got some good stuff that he was talking to me this time. This sounds like a book, though. I no, mean, no, no, you've no. Done, wait a second. You've done Trump. You've done Koch. You've done Giuliani twice. Yeah. Come on. But they're There's a book. There's no book. They're, they're complex people. Al well, Sharpton is well, a simple hustler. It's a very simple story. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Nice. What are you up to? But well, you're still at The Voice I until am. the end of the month. I am. I, got, I filed a copy uh, for my column for uh, today's paper, got tonight, which is about... Uh, 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 Andrew Cuomo and uh, the issue of where he says the new mantra should be jobs, jobs, jobs. And I went and met with a friend of mine who runs a small company up in the South Bronx who could certainly use some help and talk about the problems of getting that pledge made reality. And for next week, I'm working on a uh, police related story. I'm not going to say what it is. No, 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 no. We don't want we don't want you to right. scoop yourself. But I, you know, look, I'm a New Yorker. I'm going to keep writing about New York at, at some place. And it'll be some venue. And, uh, you know, this is the city I love. I'll stay here. And you're 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 at you're going to be at the Nation Institute. Does that mean that now your targets are, are national targets? I, oh, I, <laughs> pity those folks. Yes, I well, I, I think I probably will be doing some more national copy. But when you write about Al Sharpton, you're writing yeah. about a national yeah. figure who happened to be, I mean, I think the Obama embrace of Al Sharpton is ludicrous. It's all just Chicago politics. He can't stand Jesse Jackson, so he's wrapped his arms around Al Sharpton. But when, when he announced the extension of the Bush tax cuts, there in the front row was Al Sharpton sitting right next to Larry Summers. So, you know, I, I guess he's now possibly the, a great economic advisor to the president of the United States. So, uh, you know, he's a national figure. So some of the stuff that I do will have a national flavor. But the Nation Institute uh, is a place to hang my hat. They're, they've been almost instantly supportive by letting me come over there. It's a and, think and tank. And your crew of interns. Yes, it's a think tank. Yes, my army. I hope my oh, army man. hopefully will be coming with me. Yes. So you guys ready to uh, join uh, us in the academy and do a little teaching, maybe even a little bit TV? Huh? Huh? Yes, yeah? yes, yes, yes. You yes, can yes. talk us into it. Yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> I mean, we could do you together or separately. I don't know with you, though. You're, you're a little bit on the wild side. <laughs> you wrote a piece about uh, 
Governor Patterson at the, you know, at, at the very end of December, I guess, December 29th, mm -hmm. praising the governor. Talk about that particular piece and sort of the saga of David Patterson. It's a sad saga, isn't it? You know, I, I wrote it. I, I tell you, I, I wrote it because I was hopeful that he was going to do in his last hours even more than he had done in the few weeks before that, which is I, I started the piece by talking about these very worthy uh, prison sentence commutations mm -hmm. that he had done, one for this fellow who had already done uh, six months in prison for having uh, this incident on his lawn in Long Island, a uh, black guy who had shot a white kid who was threatening him and, and his son. Uh, a terrible story, but I thought that the governor had shown Tremendous heart and uh, and smart and courage too. It. Yeah, it was it was a tough one to do, and and then he had appointed this uh, panel to look at all of these immigration pardons. You know, because mm -hmm. of the fact the Department of Justice is now going back and looking at even minor past convictions for people who do not yeah. were not uh, permanent residents. They're they're tossing people out of the country, and and he did two dozen of those. And again, I, I thought that he showed the kind of courage in those instances that we wanted from him when he first became governor. He got sidetracked by the, the uh, Clinton Senate seat, you know, took him down. He got sidetracked by his own problems. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, when you start counting up some of the things that happened on his watch, he, there were a lot of achievements, I thought. And I just wanted to point a finger to mm -hmm. him. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know he, he increased the welfare grant. No one had done that in 20 years, right? He, he did pass a millionaire's tax which he didn't want to do the it. Rockefeller did drug it. laws got modified. He did the Rockefeller drug yep. laws. I wanted to give him a a pat on the back for that. Talk about the joy of your profession. You love doing what you're doing. What is it that attracts you? What captivates you? What makes you smile, Tom? Go ahead. You get paid to talk to people. It doesn't get any better than that. No. And and you wrote in your in your uh, final uh, voice blog that. The, it's the only profession that's paid to tell the truth. Now, I, th I take some issue with that because I, I think college professors also are a profession that. But it's talk about talk about being an investigative journalist. What is try to give us a feel of what it's like to grab onto a story. Well, what, uh, what gets you? The Sharpton story that I'm working on. It's like. There's so many pieces to a puzzle, and the way a story builds over time, if you're doing a deep investigative story, even if you're doing, and I try to always report out the blogs I write, I report them mm -hmm. out, it's like a series of building blocks. It's a series of revelations. You know what kind, how, how you can feel where every day on a serious subject that matters to you and th you think matters to a, a large number of people, that, that every day you find something new about that story. And you get up in the morning, I can't wait to get to the phones. I can't wait to get to the databases. Uh, you know, I get up in the middle of the night. I do this all the time. Drives my wife crazy. I get up in the middle I'm of the sure night. I'm sure other things yes. drive her crazy. Yeah. Oh, yes, no, yes, no, God, yes. Go <laughs> but I get up in the middle of the night and I make notes in the middle of the night because stuff occurs to me in the middle of the night. And, I, and then the next thing I do, I start the morning just chasing this new trail. And so... You know, so many jobs, uh, you know, just don't have that. Like, I thought I'd be a lawyer, right? I, I, was a, I, I was a national champion debater. I went to college on a debating scholarship. And so everybody who was a debater in my day became a lawyer. And I thought I'd be a lawyer. And, you know, when you look at the choices where you wind up representing sleazeballs, you know, whereas now I can take everyone down that I can find out something about. I mean, if you had that choice, which would you choose? Ah, yes. Obviously. Tom, you wake up in the middle of the night and take notes. Are you as rabid as I turn is? And I turn over and go back to sleep. Ah. <laughs> Look, I mean, we both have, I think, a lot of things in common in terms of, of the way we work. And one of them is that I have been trying to keep faith with readers and people that I've known, either as sources or just people around the city, going back 30 years. I mean, since I first started in the business, there's folks when I was at City Limits Magazine reporting on, on neighborhoods mm -hmm. and tenant issues mm -hmm. that I still talk to today and call me up and, and, and pull my coat and say, you got to look at this. And, and that's held true whether or not it's like a, a rank and file carpenter in the, in the city. Yeah, I you've mean, done a lot of work on private C corruption as well as public corruption, particularly yeah. in unions and construction, and the carpenters' union in particular. And and I would say that the continuing thread there is keeping faith with readers. In other words, if there are people who are not getting the story that goes untold someplace else, is the one that attracts me the most. 
the one that is not getting attention, the wrongdoing which is not being redressed. These are the great things that you get to do in our job. You, one of your aha moments, this, this joy of discovery, I mean, I, I, I reread uh, parts of Rudy, and there's stuff that you found out that Rudy didn't know. <laughs> or Rudy didn't tell anybody. Or did Rudy didn't tell anybody. Well, you know, he, he, when he was, when he first went down to Washington, he was an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District here in New York, and when they gave him his first big job down in Washington, which he was like the number six guy in the Justice Department, uh, he had to go through an FBI backgrounder for the first time, and he didn't tell them anything about his family, mm -hmm. right? At that time, he'd never made a mob case in his life, so mm -hmm. now we know he's a great mob mm -hmm. prosecutor, but this is a totally legitimate question when mm -hmm. you are going through sure. the And so he never told them that his father was a semi-wise guy, that his uncle was a full-fledged wise guy, that the FBI had killed so his cousin. So you find out about that? Yes, yeah, so I found out all about that, but whether or not, when it all came out in the book, Rudy was answered, well, I knew some of it, some of it I didn't know, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, he has to be very careful about what he says, because yeah. that's all a sworn yep. FBI questionnaire, which he had to go through. And I interviewed uh, Harold Tyler, who's now dead, but was the uh, t Deputy Attorney General of the United States who hired him and, and who certainly reviewed the FBI questionnaire, which is confidential. And he said none of this was in the questionnaire. Tom, you, one of my favorite series of pieces was one that you won an award for on Russell Harding mm. and the, the absolute corruption in and around the agency and personally. What, what got you to that story and what was your moment that, that made you say, this is it? Well, I don't know about this is it, but I, th that story came from what I was talking about before. It was simply keeping faith with readers, uh, anonymous people called me and said, this guy, I had already written a story about Russell Harding, the son of Ray Harding, the head of the Liberal Party, the guy that Rudy Giuliani called his political mentor, who had gotten this job running one of the city's uh, sort of smaller but very lucrative and important housing agencies, the Housing Development Corporation. And somebody called me and said, this guy's spending money like crazy, and, and you should try to get the records on it. I didn't know who it was, but I thought, there's a good tip. Mm -hmm. And I tried. That, that was in uh, 2000. And it wasn't, and it took me two years to get the records. Uh, they tried to hide them from me. In fact, they insisted that they were lost. Uh, none of that turned out to be true. Uh, but that was one of those episodes, I thought, which opened a window on the Giuliani administration that people understood. Rudy had always told us that he was going to give us the highest caliber of people in jobs. And yet here he was hiring the son of uh, his political mentor who didn't have a college degree to run a very complicated financial institution for the city. And the kid wasn't even in town. He was gallivanting all around the country and, and, and the nation and the world, spending money like a drunken sailor. We're going to have to continue this because time's up. I mean, it really flies when I'm talking to you two guys. My thanks to the muckrakers extraordinaire, Wayne Barrett and Tom Robbins, for being on the show. Next week, I'll talk with James Parrott, Deputy Director and Chief Economist of the Fiscal Policy Institute. See you then. Gentlemen, Thank wonderful. You. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>